Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. Our speaker today will be Dr. James Griffiths at the University of Cambridge. He's here to discuss his recent work using cathodal luminescence performed in the transmission electron microscope to, to study LED devices. James completed his undergraduate degree in physics from King's College London with first class honours. He then moved on to the University of Cambridge engineering department to pursue his master's degree before joining the, the Department of Material Science to complete his PhD on the characterization of advanced three nitride optoelectronic materials and devices using electron microscopy. Having finished his PhD, he is now continuing to work in the Cambridge Center for Gallium Nitride as a research associate, where he is continuing to research three nitride functional devices by a variety of electron microscopy techniques. Just a, a couple of points of information before we, begin, before we begin. You can submit any inquiries or questions you have via the questions pane panel available on the GoToWebinar window on the right-hand side of your screen. Issues regarding connectivity and webinar viewing will be addressed immediately. Questions for the speaker will be answered after the presentation. We will endeavor to answer any questions that are submitted, however, if there is insufficient time to answer all of the questions within the available time, then an answer will be provided by email at a later date. With that, I hand you over to James, who will talk on how nano luminescence reveals the optical properties of three nitride light emitting diodes. OK, thank you very much, David. Uh, we're going to show how nano luminescence can reveal the optical properties of three nitride devices with unprecedented spatial resolution. and can also correlate the optical properties with the structural characteristics. The three nitrides have a direct band gap that extends from 6.2 eV for aluminium nitride in the ultraviolet region over the entire visible spectrum and then to 0.7 eV for indium nitride and into the infrared. They show particularly high efficiencies over the blue spectral region and led to the very first high efficiency blue light emitting diodes. With the inclusion of then converting phosphors, this led to the development of the first high efficiency white light emitting diodes, which have superior energy efficiencies compared to other traditional forms of lighting, leading to energy and financial savings, as well as associated reductions in air pollutants and greenhouse gas emissions, which Nakamura, Amono, and Nakasaki from the 2014 Nobel Prize for Physics. The three nitrides are also suitable for a range of other optoelectronic devices. The three nitrides also form the basis of laser diodes for applications including optical projection and high density Blu-ray data storage. There is also increasing focus on the development of quantum dots for single photon sources, which are gaining increasing interest for quantum computing and quantum, quantum encryption applications. Modern nitride achieve the high efficiencies in part by using the multiple quantum well structure, which uses a thin epitaxial layer of a narrow band gap material, such as commonly for blue light emitting diodes, indium gallium nitride quantum wells, contained with gallium nitride barriers, which act to confine the carriers leading to higher radiative recombination rates. The structure and composition of the active quantum well region is responsible for the optical characteristics and then studying the optical characteristics with nanoscale resolution and correlating those with the structure and composition is fundamental for the development of higher efficiency optoelectronic devices. Whilst common optical characterization techniques such as photoluminescence and electroluminescence can provide a wealth of information, they lack the spatial resolution to resolve individual nanostructures. Cathodoluminescence in a scanning electron microscope has been widely used with great success to correlate the structural and optical features. Yet the spatial resolution in SEMCL is in part inhibited by the larger interaction volume. However, by operating at higher accelerating voltages on electron transparent samples, the interaction volume may be substantially suppressed, leading to an improvement in the spatial resolution. 
Operating in STEM also offers, offers the opportunity to record the bright field and the annular dark field STEM signals to provide information on the structure and insights into the compositions. Whilst further information may also be obtained by simultaneously recording the electron energy loss spectrum signal that can provide a wealth of information simultaneously with the optical properties. To collect the, sign the CL signal, GATAN on their latest Vulcan system have used mirrors attached directly to the sample holder in close proximity to the sample to provide a high collection angle with high detection efficiencies. This also includes a hole in the center of the mirrors to allow the electron beam to pass through. The collected CL signal is then coupled to fiber optic cables which travel along the length of the holder as shown in these images to the connectors at the end. The holder also contains a liquid nitrogen dewer to cool the sample, as can be seen here. This system is installed here on a JL2100F microscope based with our excellent collaborators at the Brunel University. The cathodoluminescent signal may then be directly detected on a photomultiplier tube, a PMT, to give a CL intensity image over all emission wavelengths, an approach that's known as panchromatic imaging. The CL intensity image may also reflect just one emission wavelength, known as monochrome imaging, by using a diffraction grating to disperse the light and then a slit to select the desired wavelength. The CL spectrum may also be recorded by dispersing the CL signal and detecting on a CCD camera. The spectrum may even be collected of a range of points in the spectrum image to provide a 3D data set. Simultaneously, other signals may be collected in the spectrum image, including the bright field, annular dark field, high, an high angle annular dark field stem signals, as well as the eel signal. This can provide a powerful approach to simultaneously study the optical and structural properties, along with the optical characteristics. The first work by STEMCL appeared in the early 1980s from Pennycook et al. on dislocations in diamond, and a number of studies also rapidly followed through the 80s and 90s. However, I think it was really in 2011 on the work that Zagonal et al., working in the research group of Matthew Kosciak at Orsay in Paris, revealed the optical properties of gallium nitride quantum disks in nanowires with a really unprecedented spatial resolution. By fitting a Gaussian peak to their spectral images, they were able to show variations in the peak emission wavelength, peak intensity, and full width half maximum of the CL signal of the nanowires, and directly correlate with the structure shown in the STEM image. On their CL line profiles, they were able to show variations in the optical properties that have occurred over just a few nanometers, along with changes in the emission wavelength in individual gallium nitride nanodisks. Further, they were able to directly correlate the observed variations in emission wavelength with changes in the thickness of the nanodisks, providing evidence for quantum confinement effects. This study really drove forward the field of nanocathodoluminescence nano and was really a great inspiration for our own work and our own studies. Whilst quantum confinement leads to higher radiative recombination rates, the three nitrides are non-centrosymmetric crystal structures leads to a strong internal electric field that separates the electrons and holes and reduces the efficiency, also known as the quantum confined Stark effect. One approach to mitigate the electric field is with the inclusion of silicon doping, which induces positive charges to mitigate the internal electric field. There is also an increasing body of work to suggest that to achieve the optimum improvement price efficiencies, requires variations in the silicon doping throughout the multiple quantum well layers, and hence nanocathodoluminescence is necessary to study the characteristics of individual quantum wells in high efficiency commercial devices. In collaboration with our industrial partners, Plessy Semiconductors, we developed a range of samples to investigate and optimize the effects of silicon doping. The overall structure of all three samples consists of an aluminium nitride buffer layer grown on silicon, followed by the growth of braided algam for stress management. This was followed by the growth of an n-type region, which also includes a silicon nitride interlayer 
to reduce the dislocation density. There are also included six in-gang quantum wells with gallium nitride barriers and capped with a magnesium doped gallium nitride layer to serve as a P-tope region. The first of the three structures was grown with silicon doping of 1 times 10 to the 18 per centimeter cubed throughout, including a higher doped region below the first quantum well, which had 5 times 10 to the 8 per centimeter cubed of silicon doping. We refer to this sample as sample A. The second sample had constant barrier doping of 1 times 10 to the 18, whilst the final sample was doped with 1 times 10 to the 17 per centimeter cubed or less, which is essentially close to non-intentional dopant levels. Before we perform the nano-CL analysis on these structures, we characterized them by aberration-corrected stem imaging, which was used to show that each of the quantum wells exhibits the same thickness across all quantum wells. Analysis of energy dispersive X-ray spectrum images also shows that the composition is uniform across the quantum wells of all three samples. Hence, there is no variation in the emission wavelength due to variations in the composition or the structure of the samples. When we f first began performing STEM, STEM CL, one of the challenges that we encountered was quenching of the emission with exposure to the electron probe. Beam damage is well reported in the nitrides, however, the CL intensity declines immediately with time, as shown here at 100 kilo electron volts. To understand the de damage mechanism, we measured the decay half-life in the CL intensity over accelerating voltages ranging from 80 to 200 kilo electron volts and found that the damage is substantially reduced at lower accelerating voltages, suggesting that displacement or knock-on damage is a responsible damage mechanism. The linear reduction in damage suggests that the damage may be completely suppressed and we tentatively suggest that there may be a threshold for damage below which it is possible to perform pristine, damage-free nanocathodoluminescence imaging. Nanocathodoluminescence imaging of the overall LED structure in cross-section shows the variation in the luminescence within the structure. Bright luminescence is observed at the top of the structure, which may be directly correlated with the quantum wells observed in the stem image. We also observe, sub, observe substantial CL intensity arising from above the silicon nitride interlayer. To understand the origin of the luminescence, we perform a spectral line profile along the length of the sample. We see that the luminescence arising from the silicon nitride interlayer is in the region of 550 nanometers, often commonly referred to as yellow band luminescence. It's previously been shown by Markert et al. that the silicon nitride interlayer serves as a nanomask, leading to three-dimensional growth, which also leads to the self-annihilation of dislocations as they bend into each other. The 3D growth also leads to the increased unintentional incorporation of oxygen, resulting in the observed yellow emission. The line profile also shows, even here with this low pixel density, variations in the emission wavelength across the quantum wells. To investigate the variation in the emission wavelength across the quantum wells, we performed here on sample A a spectral profile across the quantum wells with a pixel size of just one nanometer. It shows six distinct optical emission features that directly correlate and relate to the position of the six quantum wells identified by the simultaneously recorded stem signal and the variation in the EOS plasmon peak. And hence, we are able to show variations in the emission wavelength of individual in-gang quantum wells, where we see a blue shift in the first quantum well and then a continuing blue shift in the latter quantum wells towards quantum well six. We study here quantitatively the variation in the emission peak wavelength of each quantum well by recording more than 20 line profiles for each sample and measuring the average emission wavelength of each quantum well shown along with the typical spectra. We observe that in sample C with negligible do silicon doping, there is no variation in the emission wavelength across the six quantum wells. 
sample B with uniform silicon doping of 1 times 10 to the 18 per centimeter cubed shows a continuous blue shift towards the upper quantum wells, while sample A also shows a blue shift towards the upper quantum wells, but with the inclusion of that higher silicon doped region below the first quantum well, there is a reduction in the emission wavelength that is unique to the first quantum well that we were able to detect. And hence the shift in emission wavelength is directly correlated with the silicon doping profiles. To provide insights into the observed variations, we performed Schrodinger Poisson simulations, which accurately reproduce the observed variations in the emission wavelength. The simulated electric field also exhibits the same trend as the variation in the emission wavelength, and the mitigation of the electric field fully accounts for the very observed variations in the emission wavelength. For those of you that are more interested in the simulations, there are also further details in our manuscript that are referenced below. Hence, we have shown in this study that nanocathodoluminescence can reveal the optical properties and characteristics of individual indium gallium nitride quantum wells and show a variation in the emission wavelength which directly correlates with the silicon doping profile that was accurately reproduced by simulations and reveals the silicon doping leads to the suppression of the internal electric field in the quantum confined Stark effect. There's also been very much uh, a whole host of very good work that has been done uh, by NanoCL in the wider community by the few research groups that have access to a STEM CL system. Here in this study, Marcus Muller from the University of Magdeburg and Jürgen Christen's group have studied quantum wells going at an angle to the polar plane. You know, there's a solar semipolar planes, in this case 1 bar 1 1, to suppress the internal electric field and lead to higher quantum efficiencies. They have shown directly that the dominant luminescence arises from the semipolar quantum wells at room temperature. However, as the temperature is reduced down to 16 Kelvin by liquid helium, there is an increasing emission from the gallium nitride. To understand the origin of the additional luminescence at lower temperatures, Monochromatic images were recorded at emission peaks observed in the overall cathodoluminescence spectrum. The monochromatic images reveal that the near band edge gallium nitride emission arises from the underlying gallium nitride template, whilst the emission of both the semipolar quantum wells arises from the donor acceptor pair exciton emission in the p-type gallium nitride. To improve the luminescent intensity of optoelectronic devices, there is also an increasing movement towards the development of nanowires and nanorods, which offer potential improvements in crystal quality going on foreign substrates. And nanocathodoluminescence offers an opportunity to study the nanostructure and correlate the optical and structural properties. In this study, Arne Urban, also working at Magdeburg, has shown emission from individual gallium nitride nanorods. They have also re revealed direct correlation between stacking faults shown in the stem image with emission at 5 nanometers longer in wavelength than the gallium nitride near band edge, hence directly correlating the structural and optical characteristics of stacking faults in gallium nitride nanorods. Nanocathodoluminescence has also been used to characterize nanorods which have in indium gallium nitride nanodisc inclusions that offer the potential as light emitting diodes and nanolasers. This work was performed by Zhang Zhu from MIT, where here also the photoluminescence reveals a broad emission peak, and hence nanocathodoluminescence is an interesting technique to understand and begin to study the variation in that broad luminescent peak. Nanocathodoluminescence panchromatic imaging reveals variations in the luminescence intensity between the different nanorods, which can be directly correlated with the stem images. Monochromatic imaging is also used to show that the emission wavelength of each of the nanorods is very different, and hence in part accounts for the large line width that was observed by photoluminescence. Nanocathodoluminescence is also used to show the luminescent intensity of individual nanodisks in cross-section 2. The results show that consistently 
the upper two nano disks out of the four consistently show no luminescence, and hence nano cathedral luminescence can be a powerful technique to understanding and developing higher efficiency structures. The spectrum imaging also is used to show a consistent variation in the wavelength between the two luminescent nano disks, which also contributes to the broad observed photoluminescence line width. The high spatial resolution of na nano cathodo luminescence also makes the approach particularly well suited to the study of quantum dot structures. Gordon Schmidt et al. have shown the optical properties of gallium nitride quantum dots embedded in aluminium nitride formed and clustered around threading dislocations. Spectral line profiles performed across the length of the layer shows the presence of multiple sharp resolution limited line widths, which is indicative of the president presence of quantum dot states and it also allows for the simultaneous study of the quantum dot states along with the structural features. I would also briefly like to mention this study from Louis Tizzi and Matthew Kochia on studying single photon nature of nitrogen vacancies in diamond because whilst this isn't a necessarily a study on the nitrides it is really a great example of how the nanocathodoluminescence technique is still developing they have incorporated onto their system a Hambry Brown twist interferometer that splits the optical beam and for pure fi single photon emission there is a reduction in the correlation at zero time delay known as photon antibunching. They have shown in their structures clear evidence for a dip in the correlation function indicating without any doubt the presence of single photon emission. This makes it possible to conclusively reveal the single photon nature as well as correlate with the structural properties simultaneously. In conclusion, we have shown the detection of the cathodoluminescent signal in the scanning transmission electron microscope and offers the potential for nanoscale optical imaging to reveal the optical characteristics of individual nanostructures. Simultaneously recording the scanning transmission electron microscope signals and the EEL signals, we can directly correlate the optical characteristics with the structural and compositional properties. Nanocathodo luminescence is therefore a powerful technique for the development of three nitride optoelectronic devices and further materials. I would also just like to finally thank everyone from the University of Cambridge that has supported this work. In particular, thanks to Spark Zhang, who is now working and performing a postdoc at uh, Dusseldorf University in Germany. Uh, this work never would have been possible without our collaborators at Brunel University, where the system is installed. And in particular, thanks to Ian Boyd and Ashley Hawkins. Finally, I'd like to thank everyone at Gitan for their support, and in particular, David Stowe, who has been so helpful throughout and is here with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, James, for a, a very interesting talk. Um, we've had quite a few questions come in. Um, just a reminder to the audience that if you'd like to submit a question, then you can do so by entering it, typing it into the questions panel on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, I'm not sure that we're going to have time to answer all of your questions today, but as a reminder, we will get back to you with a full answer for all of the questions that are submitted. And we, this presentation will be available for viewing at a later date on the Catan website. Um, so James, just a few questions um, from those that have come in. Um, some are experimental and some are a little bit more about um, the technique. Mm -hmm. The first one is, um, could you remind us what temperature and accelerating voltage were used for the experiments and why did you choose these? Yeah, so coming to the accelerating voltage first, um, as we briefly discussed, one of the big challenges really was, was just that under the electron probe, uh, the cell intensity, cathodoluminescence intensity quenches. And we noticed that this is much, much more worse and severe degradation uh, at higher accelerating voltages. We performed our measurements at 80 kV because this is as low um, as the accelerating voltage will go in the microscope which we're using. 
But as you can see from one of the graphs that we presented, we do, I would say, tentative, tentatively suggest that there might be a threshold for knock-on damage, which is in the region of 70 to 71, uh, around this sort of figure, KEV. So really operating at lower accelerating voltages uh, and below this threshold means that you're not going to quench the emission. Also operating at the lower voltages means that the interaction between the electrons and the sample is much stronger. So the CL intensity um, is also much stronger. Uh, just to come to, then to your question about the temperature. So we typically work at liquid nitrogen temperatures mainly just because this gives us an increase in the luminescence intensity because there's usually a competition between the radiative and the non-radiative recombination as we call the temperature that phonon assisted non-radiative recombination is uh, largely suppressed also if the sample is cooled we also expect that there's less chance for the electrons to thermally diffuse out of the quantum well structure so also again improving the, the spatial resolution Okay, thank you. Um, and a, a supplementary question to that. Um, mm. When you see the degradation in the CL signal, do you also notice a change in the microstructure, or is that not apparent? So there's been, even before we started working on stem cl there's been lots and lots of studies talking about beam damage in, in nitrides, and one of the really early things when nitride started um, came about in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, was that people thought that these large indium clusters were uh, responsible for the high efficiencies, but it actually turned out that this was a result of beam damage. Um, but the formation of these indium clusters often occurs over several minutes. But what we tend to notice is that the CL intensity quenches almost immediately. From the moment the probe hits the sample, the CL intensity starts to quench, and then it's not until after several minutes that we start to notice um, a difference structurally, and at least in the structure that we've been monitoring, is in we've been monitoring the annual the dark field stem signal. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question: uh, What is the spatial resolution that you can achieve with with this nano CL technique? Yeah. I think really when we're studying nanostructures, the spatial resolution then becomes limited by the actual structure that we have. So well, one of the limits to cathodoluminescence is the diffusion length. But when we have nanostructures, there's diffusion of the, the carriers into the nanostructure. So when we have a series of, uh, of quantum well structures, so the carriers diffuse uh, and exist in the, in the actual nanostructures themselves. So then the spatial resolution really becomes defined by the separation of these, of these nanostructures, such as the, the quantum wells, where we've shown there were quantum wells were separated by about uh, 16 nanometers, and we will be able to resolve uh, variations on that order. There's also been work, I, I think, from the USA group, and their nano wires, they showed uh, that their gallium nitro quantum disks, if I recall, were separated by four or five nanometers, and they're able to resolve uh, the luminescence from their individual quantum disk. So as long as your structure has the quantum confinement effects, and your nanostructure has these effects, then it's really possible to achieve uh, very high spatial resolutions limited by the sample structure. Um, and is that the main advantage of cathodal luminescence performed in the TEM like this compared to the traditional SEM approach, or are there other advantages too? Yeah. I mean, certainly the, the highest spatial re optical spatial resolution is an enormous help and has really benefited us in studying these individual uh, optical nano features. I, I think really as well, though, a real big benefit, so it's not just for the nanostructure, is also having that stem signal and also having the eel signal. So you can begin to correlate much more easily, not, not just the topography, but also the actual structure, such as the defects and the composition with the stem signals, and also begin to do that with the eels as well. So you can begin to relate the composition to, to the optical uh, features as well. So it's really that, that correlation between the optical features and the, the structure and composition, uh, which is really, really helpful as well. I see. Thank you. 
Um, are these conventional specimens that you're using, or are they prepared in any special way? Uh, no, no. So the the samples that we often tend to study were grown by our uh, commercial collaborators. Uh, so they're very high efficiency uh, samples, just grown on wafers. Uh, for all a lot of the data that I've shown here today from my own work, we prepared uh, by mechanical polishing, followed by um, argon iron milling at 5 keV and then a, a low keV polish at one or, or half a keV. We've also studied there are a lot of samples that are prepared by FIV. And there's been there's a lot of concern I think with samples prepared by FIV that there's a lot of damage from the, the gallium beam. But we've tend to, tended to notice that as long as you prepare the samples but, and give them um, a low keV polish, at even 5 keV or, or lower, the, the optical characteristics are still perfectly fine um, and it's still very much possible to prepare samples by FIB and then to study them in the STEM CL. And I, I think the fact that we're often studying nanostructures, I think FIB will quite possibly be very important in the, in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, and in terms of your specimen thickness, um, yeah. Lots of people say that having a, a thick specimen is good for CL, but often for TEM you need a thin specimen. Um, so how do you select or choose the thickness of the specimen that you investigate? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it is difficult. Um, that there's just really this trade-off that um, for, a, for a thicker sample, you do get much more cathodoluminescence, intense luminescence and intensity. Although if your sample becomes too thick, um, that can reduce the, the CL uh, spatial resolution. Um, generally, when we prefer, prepare samples, we usually aim for somewhere in the region of 100 to 150 nanometers. Um, I think this is really just more, more down to experience than anything, and that we've just tended to find um, that that's kind of a good compromise between the stem and, and the eel signal. And then with that sort of thickness, we can still get very bright, intense uh, luminescence intensity. If, I, I think really, as long as we can get the luminescence intensity, yeah, we, we're happy to go, to go thinner. But somewhere, somewhere in that region, it's really, I, it really is, I think, just experience with the material, I think, to identify this. OK, thank you. And are, the, are you able to work in a regime where you are able to do simultaneous CL and Eels. Uh, yeah, so uh, as we showed earlier, I mean, one of the things that we did when we were doing this was we always recorded at the same time um, the low loss eel signal. Um, so we also have the very the shift in the plasmon peak um, that I helped us to identify the position of the quantum wells and also recording the low loss. It also actually told us the, the thickness of the sample because we were concerned um, that maybe there'd be some variation of sample thickness. It, it, it's certainly definitely very possible as well. I think, I think this is really an important area in the development of EELS uh, and, and CL. Um, that people will start to record the core loss. Um, personally, it's, it's, quite, it's quite challenging to record, from my own experience, the, the core loss um, of indium to measure the composition. But it's, it, is, it is certainly possible. And there's certainly a lot of potential to simultaneously measure uh, the composition of the structure in addition to the, the cathodoluminescence and the optical properties. So yeah, it, it, really, it really is. I think this combination of the optical and the structural um, is really interesting. I think just gathering as much data and getting as much feedback and as much information on your structure, I think, is really, is really, really helpful. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, you've measured. Uh, so the last question in terms of um, practical things, and then a couple of questions, I think, about um, the results in more general. Is it possible all of the results you show here, or lots of the results you show on your work, are um, the cross-section of samples? Is it possible yeah. also to measure them in plan B? Um, yeah, yeah, it, it certainly is possible. Um, I think. It could be particularly interesting, you know, if you have core shell structures and then you take a cross section through the 
So you're looking, for instance, down, down in nanorod and you're looking at the core shell um, of these nanostructures. That's, that's certainly very interesting. And it's not a challenge to prepare those samples, either uh, conventionally by mechanical polishing or by fib. Um, but I think I think yeah that could that is certainly says something that could be could be very interesting. Okay, and um, I think the, we have time for one more question. Hmm. Um, you've measured the um, the nanoscale properties here, um, yeah. and you've shown us those results in this presentation. Um, yeah. Have you also measured device performance, and how how does the information that you gain from this technique? Yeah, Tell you something yeah. about the uh, device performance. Yeah. <clears throat> so I mean, that's one of the really fortunate things that we were working on this um, investigation with our commercial industrial collaborators. Um, so it was really a combination of the two. So working uh, with our commercial collaborators, we were able to uh, develop these structures, um, and they were able to to perform device measurements, and then as they saw improvements in device measurements, and we correlated uh, the optical properties, and then we were able to confirm that actually a lot of the improvements in device efficiency were most likely due to these um, suppression of the electric field that we observed. So it was really, yeah, this, this great combination of, of actually trying to improve the device, um, as well as as, as well as our own studies to explain and understand and then begin to develop. And the silicon doping profile that we showed here where the, the sample A was the highest efficiency, had 5 times 10 to the 18 in the, below the first quantum well and then 1 times 10 to the 18 throughout, uh, showed the highest efficiency. But I really, as, as commercial developers move forward and they perform more and more simulations, these silicon doping profiles become much, much more complex and uh, this was a good proof of concept, but we're, we're continuing to work on uh, developing higher efficiency devices. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's um, all we have time for today. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for the really interesting work. Um, and there are more questions that we haven't had time to get to today, but we will respond to all of the questions that have been submitted. And to remind the audience, this presentation or a recording of this presentation will be available from um, the Gatan website www.gatan.com um, within the next week or so. Thank you for your time today and um, thank you again James for um, a really fascinating talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>